Professor Lipstein, you've been associated with the Faculty of Law and the Squire Library in various ways for the past 71 years. You've kindly agreed to share with me some of your recollections over this period, and I wonder if we could start in 1934, when you first arrived in Cambridge, and then we could cover the period leading up to the Second World War. Well, clearly my work was concentrated on the Squire Law Library, because I was preparing a doctoral dissertation. The Squire Law Library was at that time housed in a building in Downing Street. And you can still see that it was, because there's a stone inscription uh, which says that this was a building which put up at the expense of Rebecca Squire and her husband and her brother. The library was in the, on the first floor and was just one big room. That contained all the books that there existed. And then there was a little staircase which led up to the uh, roof rooms. And there were the additional room, uh, books which nobody wanted to look at. They were the ones on comparative law they were the beginning of the Library of Comparative Law, and that is where the professor sat, Professor Guthridge. Down below were only two people. There was the librarian, Mr. Staines, who didn't know anything about law, but he was simply there to catalogue the books and to stack them away when it was necessary. And he was helped by Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill did all the labour which was required. This he did during daytime. When that was finished, he served as a, uh, as a, a servant at dinner at Keyes College. And then, when that was finished, he patrolled the streets with the proctor as a so-called bulldog with a nice uh, black coat and a top hat. <laughs> So that, those were the librarians? That was the librarian. Two men and a, a one big room. The library itself was housed together with the law school, which was downstairs. And that is where I began. I didn't go to many lectures. I, lect uh, I went to the ones on Roman law by Professor Buckland, which were in indeed very good. And... Uh, I do not believe that I went to it as I was far too busy preparing my dissertation. But of course there were other people whom I met there. There was an, for another, another PhD student. There were very few PhD students at the time. It was not done uh, in, uh, to do this. The degree had only been introduced after the war. And I think we were about the first, practically the first people to... Uh, apply for it. Very and this meant, uh, with me, was the uh, Frenchman who later on became the famous Professor René David of France. And were all the materials you needed available in the small library? No, we, we, it meant we used what we could use and what we hadn't, we hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> so how did this library compare with the library you were used to in Germany? Well, so far as it was English law was concerned, it was, uh, of course, a very comprehensive library. There wasn't that much uh, yet at that time. There weren't that many periodicals or anything. Right. And K textbooks were also not that frequent. So one could deal with that in one very big room. Yes. Uh, the foreign law library, of course, was just being built up because Guthrie had only come to Cambridge in 1930 or 1931, and I came in 1934. So there wasn't very much yet. As I said, it was enough for two rooms in the, uh, in the roof. Was he responsible for comparative law? He was, uh, yes. He had to lecture on conflict of law and had, uh, was known as the reader in comparative law. So he was eager to develop this? He was, he was the only one who bought it. Nobody else knew anything about it. And prior to... Nobody. He, he was. He did everything. Right. He did everything. Before him, there can't have been anything. 
But he came in 1930, I came four years later, by that time there was something. Right, and between the two of you, you built it up over and the years. Then, uh, well, he was very much the man in charge till the World War, yes. certainly. Yes. I was our only a uh, young foreign student. But what sort of a man was he, Professor? He was, which, uh, to dis describe him in English terms, a Yorkshire. <laughs> that is to say, he was uh, thick set, loved good food, loved good life, yeah. and uh, what was extraordinary with him, he had grown up in part in Italy because his father had been uh, had some illness, and the doctors had advised him to retire to a country with a good climate, and so he retired to Naples. And if you go to Naples even now, you will find in the main square um, a men's outfitter shop called Guthridge. That was Papa, how he kind of oh, yeah. occupied his time. And Guthridge himself grew up there. He spoke fluent Italian, although he spoke with a strong local accent, which the professors who visited him later on found very funny indeed. <laughs> When you say local accent, you mean a Yorkshire accent? No, so Italian accent. Italian, right. understand. <laughs> <laughs> so he um, uh, was fully conversant with he, Italian law. He, yes, he yes. also had, by that time, uh, had a lot of international contacts. He was uh, one of the members of a United Nations committee which supervised the work of a committee in Rome on the unification of the law of arbitration, which in due course contained, consisted of, which had consisted of three people, René David from France, a German called Ficker, and an Englishman, Wortley. And that is how René David came to us, because in supervising this committee, Catherine uh, um, found out that David had another few years before he had to take up his job in France. So he said, come to England and join Trinity Hall, take a PhD. This is what uh, David did, that's how I got to know him. And what sort of a person was he, Professor, as you recall? He was a man with much wit. <laughs> uh, the first year he joined the student body of Trinity Hall and Road. This was the year when French governments fell every month one. He <laughs> rode and one day he came and said, Sorry chaps, can't row. What's the matter? I've become Minister of the Marine. <laughs> Ooh! And he rode off. Ten minutes he came back. It's all right, but chaps, I can now row. What's the matter? Ministry has to resign. <laughs> um, that was René David, who had, of course, a long career, um, which was a very famous one, both in France and in the, uh, especially he made the code for Ethiopia later on. Oh. But uh, the most famous yeah. thing is probably when he was a uh, prisoner in 1944, and uh, he was in charge of a unit, and somebody still continued shooting. So they lined him up, lined the officers up, and said, war crimes, and you're going to be shot. But René David, when he uh, had been himself a member of that committee in Rome, had told the Englishmen and the Germans always to talk their own language with him. So he was absolutely fluent in German. So he replied in fluent German, you're committing a great mistake. I'm an intimate friend of General Goering. Goering. That, of course, stopped everything. And he was yeah. not shot, nobody was shot, yeah. and everything was survived. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the other... PhD student who you were with was um, Daub. Mm. W was he somebody whom you had quite a bit to do with? Did you get to know him quite well? We knew each other, but uh, we b came back from the same background and were both fighting our own uh, way. And so we, I didn't see him an awful lot. I mean, we talked to each other, but he was uh, clearly a very much better Roman lawyer than I did was. He had been assistant to a most famous German professor, 
had been recommended to Buckland in Cambridge, had been given a scholarship in Keys, and therefore he was quite clearly better than I am, and so we didn't deal with our own subject matter because I, I knew that he was the one who was much better. And you concentrated I on concentrate your private on, international right, law? Much more on private international yes. law. I did yes. Roman law, and I made a dissertation in Roman law, but I concentrated on private international law, so that we didn't overlap. Excellent. And then, to that end, you became Professor Guthridge's assistant? He, well, he was very kind to me, because in 1936 I got my doctorate, and I was invited to become a, a research fellow in Trinity, but I didn't get the research fellowship, and so I had nothing. And uh, although my British family was going to pay for me, it was a really a rather awkward situation, especially since my British uncle didn't like people who had no firm occupation. And so Guthridge made me formally his successor and paid me something. And there were other um, lawyers at the time who were very famous, such as the um, Yule professor, Professor McNair, um, McNair was an extremely kind man to me. I had an introduction to him from some other friends of mine. Uh, he was a man of few words, but very clear, very straightforward, and uh, he had a seminar where we all met uh, once uh, every, during term time every, to discuss topics, and he asked me to give a paper and this is what was my first introduction to a, a paper in English, uh, which was later on uh, the basis of my article on international law and uh, in, in, interna uh, in public, private national and international tribunals. I see. Uh, this was uh, open to all the teachers in public international law, the supervisors in public international law, and any students who were interested in it. It was a, a very nice meeting, uh, which I remember with pleasure. Which was attended by many famous people. Uh, there were all, a number of them. Uh, there was Mervyn Jones, who later on uh, wrote a very good book on public international treaties, um, and uh, unfortunately died young. And uh, there must have been quite a number of others whom I now can't remember. There always were a lot of people from abroad. Do you have recollections of Professor Buckland, who was on the Library Committee between 1926 and 1934? I certainly remember Buckland, because he was one of my first ports of call when I investigated coming to Cambridge. I was taken <coughs> to him by a law fellow of Trinity, to, Trinity to meet him at Grain, number 7 Grange Road, where he lived. His house is now near back, nearly back to back with mine. And there was the elderly gentleman, benevolent, very learned, and very much a civil lawyer. In fact, he was strictly limited to civil law. He did not know very much other, other legal systems. But within this, he was a great expert and a very kind old man. He was by that time nearly seventy. We had a discussion in his library, and we agreed I should come and join the faculty. After that, I mainly went to his lectures, which were extremely good, very well prepared, but probably too difficult for youngsters. So did he supervise your PhD? No professor would, uh, could uh, supervise a PhD at that time. It is probably... Uh, no, that is probably wrong. Darber was probably looked after by Buckland. I wasn't. So I was looked after by Patrick Duff. Do you have recollections of Professor Duff? He was a classical, classical scholar, but otherwise he did not excel uh, in, uh, he did not produce any further work after he had published a book and an article. So, Professor, what do you remember of Mr. Harry Holland? who joined the Library Committee in 1930. That is, of course, a very different matter. Hannah Holland was a member of the Suffolk Gentry, 
where his family had a big estate, where his mother, he used to say, my mother is a whore. That did not mean what you might think. The whore was spelled H-O-A-R-E. She was a member of a famous banking family. He'd been a pupil of Maitland and prided himself that he was interested in history of English law. Had been a fellow of Trinity and before the First World War, since before the First World War, had been a major in the war, came back and been a very dominant person. He acquired a predominant influence in Trinity College, where he became vice master. In my day, he was the vice master, and he really set the tone. He was very kind to me. The first days, of, uh, of course, I was a complete outsider. But in the days afterwards, when I had become a supervisor, he used to see me quite a lot, because in 1944, I had become the secretary of faculty, and Harry Holland had been the chairman of the faculty for at least ten years. So we met on Tuesday once a week to deal with the faculty affairs in his rooms in Trinity for lunch in order to settle all outstanding matters. A good administrator, a man of good common sense, probably not an outstanding lawyer, um, he did not produce any of the notable written work. Uh, but he always said that he might have produced the textbook on new property law had Cheshire not done so. But he was certainly an outstanding personality who set his tone to the faculty very strongly uh, because he was very strongly influenced in what? Influential. Strongly influential. In who was appointed and, uh, and the appointments were mostly due to him, including my own. A personal reference to him is to be found in uh, Snow's book called The Master. Uh, Professor, any recollection of Mr. Wade? Eminent Wade, not to be confused with Bill Wade, was a fellow of Keyes. A good constitutional lawyer, but a somewhat stiff former man whose imagination was probably not in, in, enormous, but whose knowledge was very good indeed, and whose good common sense emerged from the following, that when he, that when he looked in 1938 that there might be a war with Germany in this country, he asked, Kurt, are you going to be under the prerogative, which for a constitutional lawyer meant, can you be interred without trial? To which my answer was yes. He was that kind of straightforward man who could have a straightforward question or a straightforward answer. Thank you, Professor. So, um, the Hirsch Lautkart, who was on the Library Committee from 1938 to 1954, helped to develop the international law collections, and perhaps you have some memories of him. He came after a distinguished tenure in London. There may have been some doubts as to whether he, to appoint him or not to the famous chair, but finally he was, and he tackled his new task with energy. Um, <clears throat> shortly afterwards, the international law activities in Cambridge were certainly considerable. He was an editor of Oppenheim, he did all the lecturing. At the same time, he had to accommodate himself to the new surroundings in which he lived, which was new now college life, which he hadn't done before. Fellowship was something new to him, but he established himself well, and of course, during the war, was constantly used by the government in England. He had go, and he had to go quite frequently to the United States. Other famous names um, which, or, which you encountered during this period include the name of Professor Winfield. Winfield was a fellow of St. John's and had at that time reached really the top of his career. He had written or already a number of other things and then just written his famous textbooks on the law of tort. He was a man uh, who was not very lo uh, lo uh, loquacious. He was very precise and uh, uh, very helpful. 
as I in turn, I think was helpful to him, because in his book there appear all sorts of references to me when I was only a little research student. So we must have had some conversations and things together. Uh, he was a good lecturer, but uh, and uh, altogether a man whom uh, one trusted the moment one saw him, absolutely straightforward. So was McNair. So was McNair. Another name which um, springs to mind is that of uh, Professor Hazel Tyne. Hazel Tyne was an American, and he had had an interesting career because he had studied uh, his, uh, legal history in Germany oh. with some of the most famous German people, and then come to England and had a Downing professorship, which at that time meant that he had a house in Downing College. But since he was uh, divorced, I think, or his wife may have died, uh, he lived, uh, was alone, served by a butler. Mm. And I used to go there quite a bit because I discussed certain problems of legal history with him. He was a very out, uh, forthcoming, a very friendly uh, man who was well uh, and uh, of considerable knowledge, though he had not much influence because he did illegal history and was an American. And uh, as soon as the war broke out, he was persuaded to go back to America, and so I never saw him after that oh, again. <laughs> Very interesting. When you did your PhD, one of your supervisors was Professor Jolovitz, who at that stage was in London. Do you have any recollections of him? He was only my examiner, and uh, so I met him when I, when I was examined for my PhD. Yes. So I can't really, this is the father of Tony, yes. I, I can't, can't say much of that. They were, I remember being once there for the oral examination. No, I can't. Did you go down to London? I had to go down to London in his house, and the, that was the examination. And that was in... That was in 1936. And then in 1937 you became uh, Professor Guthridge's assistant and... And started supervision. And research, an active program of research, and you were also given the job of the upkeep of the foreign law section of the library. That well, was one of your duties. Well, that was one of my duties. I had to rearrange it. it was, Professor Guthridge, of course, had always the last word. <laughs> <laughs> I was merely the help. Did you select material? I cannot remember, but I, we must have done so. But we didn't buy that much at that time. We kept it to the main textbooks and uh, one or two periodicals and nothing more. Uh, the budget was obviously very much smaller. So this takes us up to the May of 1940, mm -hmm. where um, we know that yes. you had the unfortunate experience of being interned in Liverpool until September 1940. And once again, during that experience, you met some very wonderful, interesting people, um, including, including the grandson of the late German Kaiser. Indeed, I did. And um, do you have any recollection? The only funny recollection I have uh, was that we were given special writing paper, uh, but by, by, which so, was so prepared that you couldn't send secret messages. It looked awful. <laughs> and he was there and saying, it's very awkward, very awkward. My aunt has a birthday. I cannot send her this. That was Queen Mary. <laughs> <laughs> that was aunt. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> And there were other very illustrious people in that gathering who, for example, Justice Kerr was one. Oh, Lord Justice Kerr, of course, was a student at uh, Clare College at that time. Uh, one didn't know that he was going to have a very good career. He was just a little law student. Gosh. Uh, 
No, of famous people, all also not yet famous. There was Perutz, who later on got a Nobel Prize for his uh, structure of hemoglobin. Uh, that was the future astronomer royal for Scotland. There were uh, one future professor of uh, medicine and of biology in Cambridge. There were, there were quite an interesting lot of people. That must have uplifted you, despite the well, seriousness of the circumstances. One lived from day to day and didn't look around very much. Yes. It was, uh, so how to survive? Yes. So you were released in September and then you, you returned to Cambridge and you continued with your supervisions and in 1944 you were married and I've read in sev several works that this was a turning point you look upon that as a very important um, yes. milestone. after all it's one thing being an old bachelor and starting a married life and of course I was uh, very fortunate to marry a woman who was very much a personality in her own right and uh, can, I'm not going to give you the history of all she did, but I can tell you that she ended up uh, uh, as one of the backers of the new Liberal Democrats, of a, as a city councillor, as a, a, br a brown owl, uh, as everything you, uh, which had to be dealt with, she dealt with. Very interesting. <laughs> and then you, in that same year, were appointed as secretary of the Faculty of Law. Yes, well, of course, in the First World War, the university closed down. They didn't do that in the Second World War. But, of course, there were very few people to study, only those who either were not called up because there were some defects, physical defects, or because they were waiting to be called up and very young, or uh, foreigners, mainly from the, colon uh, from the uh, Commonwealth country. Oh. So things continued. Things in fact, simply continued. Yes. But it, obviously it's all very much restrained yes. until suddenly peace broke up. Yes. Oh. And then suddenly the faculty from 30 became one of several hundred students. Oh. And that meant a tremendous amount of work preparing everything. And you, to return, I had to. And you then, in 1946, became a lecturer. In 46, I became a lecturer. Yes. Yes. Well, that takes us up to the end of the period, which mm -hmm. I hope yeah. we would discuss. Good. And the next time, perhaps we can do the next chunk. Well, think about that. Yes. Th that's much more difficult to say because I lectured and and administered. Uh, I can't tell you an awful lot about the library. I can tell you what we did when you yes. moved it here. Yes. Thank you, Professor. Right, thank you. Thank you. Have we forgotten something?